welcome to Ilham. Uh, we are delighted to welcome our two guests today, Joe Kukudas and Sanjay Kumar Par Parumal, in the first of a series of conversations we have entitled The Creative Process. In this new series, which will be organized for every exhibition season, we invite two Malaysian artists from different genres to talk about the ideas behind their art and the messy, sometimes I'm sure frustrating, and mysterious process of making something new. This program is also about celebrating stories about our nations, Malaysian stories, whether they are told in a play, a film, a music composition, or work of art. Today, we kick off our series with two amazing Malaysian artists. Joe Kukudas was educated in Malaysia, Australia, Hong Kong, India, and the UK, where she studied politics and philosophy. She returned to Malaysia and co-founded the company, the Instant Cafe Theatre Company, in 1989. The company quickly achieved cult status in Malaysia with its social satire and new Malaysian writing. Today, Joe is an award-winning director, actor and writer and artistic director of the Instant Cafe Theatre Company. Sanjay Kumar Parimal is a film graduate of University Science Malaysia. He won the 2009 BMW Shorties Award for his production, Machai. He is well known for his film, Jagat, which won the top film award at the Malaysian Film Festival Awards and has premiered at international film festivals all over the world and was a huge critical success. Sanjay was scriptwriter, talent caster, acting instructor, and even designed the film's posters. Before I pass the mic over to them, uh, I would just like to uh, tell you briefly about the format. Um, Joe and Sanjay um, are going to be asking each other questions, uh, so they're really going to be in conversation with each other, uh, and after which we'll sort of break for questions from the audience. So, Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Joe Kukadas and Sanjay Kumar Paramal. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Actually, this is the second time we've ever met. Yeah. <laughs> the first time was yesterday, <laughs> uh, where we met for a very quick lunch. I think it was, it was supposed to be half an hour, and uh, we both forgot, forgot the time completely, and I was late for my rehearsal, and, uh, he, um, and we just, just forgot the time in chatting with each other. It was nice to finally meet you after just talking to you on the phone or WhatsApping you. Yeah, yeah same here. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, probably I can <coughs> start. Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've seen your performance in, 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 the, in the YouTube you know, with your five different characters, right? So, uh, yeah, I must admit that uh, the few characters out of five, right, probably three characters is right, really uh, mind-blowing, actually. Uh, why I want to say this? Because um, I have a problem with, with many... Uh, Malaysian TV and uh, film actors. Uh, some people are, for me, being overrated. But I, but I, I can't see, they're, they're, they're only acting as themselves, not as a character. But I could feel that in your character, that, that you have transcended into someone else. And uh, I can feel uh, the energy out of the screen hitting me. So, so I have this question, you know. Uh, in the video, you also mentioned that uh, did the process and the origin of the few characters. So uh, I have this question: Did you ever foresee, or did you ever had the premonition that in the future these characters are going to come inside you? Did you ever had the premonition? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, in fact, I was I was reading something interesting recently about the the etymology of the word genius. 
I'm not to say that I'm saying I'm a genius, um, but it's interesting this word genius that we think now it's an attribute of somebody inside themselves, or that person is a creative genius. They they have inside them some ability to create, but the original idea of a genius was more connected to the idea of genie, right? That actually it is an outside spirit. That a, a genie is an attendant spirit that sometimes just comes and says, "Oh, you're available," so we'll come and. Uh, you know, spend some time with you, and um, th that was the original idea of the of the idea of the artist. That the artist was somebody who literally was inspired by some some outside force, not their own ability or their own self, their own ego, who came up with something, but literally an attendant spirit. And maybe this makes it life much easier if we think about it in this way, <laughs> because then we don't go around looking for it. We uh, we wait for it to. Um, we, we look for it in a way, we, or rather we say we are open to it. We are open to whatever it is that's going to happen. And each of those characters, I didn't go out looking for them. They turned up in very odd circumstances, um, and not necessarily fully formed. I didn't even know who they were completely. The first time I put on the song coat for YB, the reason I wore the song coat is because I used to have really long hair. So it was just practical. I just knew I wanted to say something as a government minister, and it was like, and something said, "Oh, you need to perform this minister, not talk about the minister, be the minister." And I thought, "Okay, I'm a, I'm a woman, etc. Okay, what? How do I disguise this? Just put on a song court. Then that led to the bush jacket. Then that that led to the big <laughs> bunch of flowers. These are all just ways to disguise the surface of it. Um, but it, I never thought I must create this character." I, so that's for me, a, yes, an interesting thing that we don't try to create it. They they come from somewhere and introduce themselves in some fragmentary way. Yeah. I mean, do you ever had this uh, this kind of image or hint that these are the characters that are going to appear in the future? Probably the hint. You're not looking for it, but the hint is coming to you. It's like giving you a hint that I'm coming in the future. I think the hint comes, maybe they're always around, and then something happens circumstantially that then you notice them. <laughs> uh, so, for example, uh, when I was very young, I, I, I used to have a company with my sisters and my cousins called The Banana Bunch, and we would put on shows <laughs> for our relatives. Um, and one time, and very often when we did this, there'd always be a role of a judge or a lawyer, because we had uncles and aunts who were judges, uh, who were lawyers. So it was easy to borrow their robes and borrow their wigs. <laughs> so I, I remember as a child playing this role of a judge, and, and we used a hammer, because we didn't have a proper gavel, so we used a hammer. Then years later, during the whole um, Anwar Ibrahim trial, sodomy one, as we call it, um, I was sitting in a room with some friends, including Cam Razlan over there, and we were trying to write a piece. And we didn't know what we wanted to write, and Cam, Cam just said, well, well, let's just put it in a courtroom. It was just very random. Okay, put it in a courtroom. So we all started writing a script set in a courtroom. And Cam just wrote this one line, which was, you stand accused of sodomy. <laughs> and and I wasn't intending to play this character, but it ended up my playing this character of this judge who was accusing everybody who comes to his courthouse of having been guilty of sodomy. <laughs> so this character came about in this way, but then when I think about it, I think, but that character was there a long time ago. But I, so maybe it was waiting all the time um, because I'd always been around such kind of legal minds and maybe in some way it was waiting. I hadn't thought about it before you asked me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it, maybe my, my third character, Curry Spice, I think she turned up literally because I went looking for a wig for Ribena Berry, and I came across this gigantic curly wig, and I put it on my head, and it just spoke to me. And, this, and I think, but it spoke to me because at that time, I wanted a character, I, ne I needed a character who's going to be more direct. I need a character who was not going to be like my other characters, trying to excuse the government, trying to excuse our social system. Curry Spice basically, excuse my French, told everybody to fuck off. <laughs> I mean, that's not, that's not me speaking, that's her. <laughs> that's how she speaks. And she was so direct, and I, I, it was very liberating. 
So whenever I put on that wig, I felt I could just say what I wanted. You know, I was saying to Sanjay earlier that actually I'm, I'm always very uncomfortable speaking as myself in public. I much prefer speaking through these characters. So I'm a bit nervous right now talking to everybody as myself. Um, but those characters will speak much more boldly. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I don't know about... I, I mean, do you ask this question because you feel that those characters that you have portrayed have been always there in your life? Uh, it's not the characters, but the, but the subjects. Mm. Um, I could say that almost like 90% of my, my, my current works, mm. I already had the premonition back, like oh. 10 years back. So there's a strong feeling that I wanted to do this subject. I don't know why, mm. but I have a strong feeling that, yeah, in the, in the past I wanted to do something about my grandfather. Mm. And also I wanted to do something, to shoot something in my hometown. Mm. And then, it, and I did it. Mm. And uh, I also wanted to do a travelogue in, in, in Borneo. I will, so it's kind of, you already had the premonition back in a strong feeling and then slowly it's happening. So it's sometimes it's kind of scary of mm. uh, thinking what kind of feelings that we have right now because mm. it's going to determine the future projects. <laughs> 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 so yeah, that, that's why I, I was cu curious to ask you whether you have that uh, hint. Yeah, I think those hints come in this way, not so much through a character, but um, I, I, the last few years I started writing more stories about a sort of fictionalized version of my family. I mean, there's a lot of autobiography in all of our work, of course, but in this case I started writing things and it was based on um, my mother's family in Ipoh, but then wildly extrapolated and fictionalized at the same time. And I'm, I think it was my sister who said this to me, or I remember, is my sister here? She can, I've got a terrible memory. Yeah, and she said, oh yeah, Tata, my grandfather, always said you'd write these stories. <laughs> and I had forgotten that, but then I remembered, yeah, as a child, he always said, oh, one day Joe will write our stories. <laughs> and I have no idea why he thought that or knew that at the time, but I always thought I would as well. I always, actually, I wanted to be a writer when I was young. I didn't want to be an actor. Acting was, wasn't really something I, I dreamt of as a child. I always dreamt of being a writer and telling stories, and I always dreamt of traveling and seeing people's lives and then writing about other people's lives. Um, that's what I was interested in. So, I mean, most people, I guess, know me for those characters that I, that I create, those five characters, but not to say that they are a diversion from where I was supposed to be going. I think I have learned a lot from them over the years about character, but the thing I'd wanted to do that from the beginning was to write stories about people around me, people that I knew. Mm. Yeah, and, and now I am. So that is a bit, you know, <laughs> that is, if you, as you say, a bit creepy. Yeah. How do you manage the, the characters, you know, internally, yeah, emotionally? Sometimes I, I really can't. <laughs> Uh, I mean, recently I, I did a show in um, in Bobo's in KL, and I was just playing two characters, but it was just before the elections, and both characters were, and I was um, just at the end of my tether. I just thought, we need to win this election. I cannot, if, cannot imagine my life if we don't. And of course, there have been many elections and there have been many disappointments and many heartaches over the years. And this time it was like, I cannot, I cannot go through any more heartache. And my characters were therefore in a very fragile and very excitable state. And I'm having to live with them. So I was trying to write uh, the monologues for both these characters and I found them really hard to live with. Um, the first character, Rabina Berry, wrote um, a survival guide on surviving the Malaysian in elections. That's what she wrote and that's what she performed. <laughs> And the second character um, created a piece called A Manifesto for a Better Malaysia, which basically said, forget the survival guide, change the system. So Kari Spice said, uh, don't try to work with the system, break the system. The next prime minister of Malaysia should be Kari Spice because she is an Indian bisexual woman and more importantly, she's a work of fiction. So that's why Malaysians basically need to have a belief in things which don't exist. <laughs> Uh, maybe we need to break the, the mold that we're in right now. Break my microphone too, hello. Uh, um, yeah, so it's not always, yeah, not always, oh, easy, thank you. Living with them, um, but you know, we just do live with them. 
for a very long time. I mean, I, I know that you live with Apoi for, well, you're still living with him, right? Yeah. Yes, and you're still, he's part of you and you're part of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they never go away, and they, but they don't always, they're not always dominant. But I suppose, I mean, I, I'd like to ask you about Apoi in this way as well, you know, at what point he became dominant in your life and you had to do something about him. I think Apoy have been living with me since I was 12. And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, I was actually I was trying to do something else. I, I was trying to uh, to write something else, but but uh, this this story keep on you know, coming and haunting me. So I couldn't do anything else at all at one point. So um, at one point I, 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 I made peace with him with the character and also with the story that saying that I'm not going to touch you for, as for now. I'm going to concentrate on other things and then I'll come back to you whenever I feel comfortable. And then it was just fine. Until uh, I, I, was, I was shooting a documentary for MySkill Foundation. Uh, MySkill Foundation is a foundation that manages uh, school dropouts, uh, the, the, the problematic youths. When I see them, I understand that they are much more worse than a poi character actually, and then the the issue need to be addressed right now. So that is where I decided that this is the time that I'm going to to, to do the movie, and also I have another so-called calling. You know, I, I will say because I, I used to tell my friends that if I didn't find the perfect characters and perfect location for the movie, I'm not going to roll it. So I was waiting for probably I was just telling the <laughs> excuse to postpone the thing, you know. So I was, I, I told my friend saying that I, I'm looking for a location. It, it should be a valley and a, um, a squatter area valley and then there should be a mountain behind it and with the zinc rooftop. So I used to tell my, my, my friends that whenever you go to scout location, just look for this location. And then they'll say, no, it's impossible to find in Malaysia. <laughs> So I couldn't find the location. That's one thing. And the other thing is, I'm looking for a 12 years boy to 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 play a boy's role, which is very hard to find. If you see in the in the TV or drama, you always see the bubbly, fair skin, uh, uh, you know, cute boy. So if I want to do a, even an audition, I'll I'm going to get the same boys again and again. So it's very hard for me to cast a, a working class uh, people. So it's very hard for me to to reach them. So it was very hard for me, but at a certain point, I, it, it was a very surreal experience when we were shooting in Kotabaru and then, uh, yeah, after we were shooting in Kotabaru, we just um, came to Greek and then I say we just go and have a look in Greek and then we went to this place called Klianintan and then when I was standing there looking at the place, it was like a premonition, it was like I've seen that image before, a few years back. The exact image, I've seen it before. It's like I, I had a goosebump and then I said, we are ready to roll. And then after, after a week, I saw this boy when I was shooting for, uh, for the My Skill Foundation. I saw this boy, he was fighting with another boy. So I just called him, why did you fight? He said, no, no, I didn't fight. So suddenly he became innocent. So <laughs> it was like a switch from you know, wild, uh, into an innocent boy, so I like that uh, he can play both characters. <laughs> so, so that that was the thing that I, I I didn't know whether he can act or not. I said he's the boy. I mean, I, I have the strong feeling. So, so that's how it's happened. Actually, it's like um, it's like a calling. Yeah, it's so it's a surreal feel. Yeah. yeah. I remember you you said in an interview that um, you at first you wanted to make a film about that boy, but then as as you began to work on it, you realized actually it wasn't just the story of that boy. Was it at this point, or did that happen at an earlier point? It, it happened much earlier, actually. Um, when I just wrote a one-page synopsis, I was 24 years old. I was just graduating after, you know, uh, after university. I, I wanted to do something, so I just wrote the synopsis. Because uh, Jagat was originally called Apoi. The title was Apoi, and it was originally a, a, a comedy film, actually. It was supposed to be a comedy film. But then uh, later on, I, I, I realized that the story is not about the boy. The story is about the system. The story is about the surrounding and the other characters that shaping this boy. So, and then I found out that it's much more darker than, 
because when you look at it from a child's perspective everything is enjoyable everything is funny right but when you look at it a step outside from the character you will see the system is rotten and then yeah it is not funny anymore so yeah uh, that's how it it uh, it is shifted from comedy to much more dark uh, subject yeah I, yeah i want to ask you so how do you manage between um, hope and darkness yeah i guess for me it started off by comedy <laughs> Um, I think we started doing comedy because times were so dark. So you can't just then, when there's so much darkness, just create more darkness. So I think the instinct was then to create something that was going to counter it, but actually shed some light on it in some way. Um, um, I mean, I don't think we we thought about it in that way. Maybe so it's, it's instinct, right, at, at the time. I was with a, a group of friends, and we all, I think, felt in a very similar way. And so I think instinctively we, we turned towards comedy. And it was funny because before this we'd all been doing, you know, a bit of Shakespeare, a <laughs> bit of this and that. So we weren't necessarily, you know, we'd, and we didn't see ourselves as comedians. We saw ourselves as actors. But after uh, Instant Cafe was formed and we started doing comedy, immediately we were labeled as, oh, those comedians. And then when we started doing other kinds of theatre, people said, oh, but aren't they comedians? <laughs> so it's interesting how people want to also sort of um, yeah. label you, peg you in a certain way. But we moved towards comedy at that time because that's what was needed. I think, you know, um, and because comedy can speak, um, it speaks less directly, um, or especially could speak very uh, indirectly in Malaysia. You could have a character saying how great everything was, and of course, audience knew that you were saying exactly the opposite, and yet um, a censorship board will not be able to say you can't say that because you're saying how fantastic everything is, and that's how these characters got created, like the minister character YB got created because he's there advocating for... Um, um, his point of view, and his point of view is everything is perfect. And yes, corruption is um, uh, not a problem because I think one of his, one of my favorite lines of his was when he's accused of corruption, he says, "No, no, no, I don't take bribes, I take gifts." <laughs> you know, so it's this, this. Um, I think that's one way of 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 um, countering darkness. But I think the other thing is is to tell stories, right? And uh, I remember some years ago, I was running this um, program for, for new writers because I felt, well, we need to have other kinds of stories being told. And I was working with this one uh, writer, Shannon Shah. And he used to work for Radic Radio, and he had a lot of important things he felt he wanted to say. And he was working a lot on uh, things to do with um, gender studies, with um, Islam. And the first things he, he wanted to write about were very heavy. And... Uh, and Yet, he, I said to him, but you're also a songwriter. <laughs> you're going to not change people by writing these tracks, these pamphlets. You will change people by the songs that you write. So don't think of a scriptwriter as being somebody who's going to write a pamphlet. Think of a scriptwriter as somebody who's writing a song. Because a song has, has a rhythm and a music which moves us, and inside there's some sort of narrative which moves us, and think in this way. And I think once you start writing a song, the song can be very uh, beautiful, and it'll move us and say all those things you want to say. Or there's another writer... Uh, Arun Subramaniam, and he wanted to write a story. He said, I want to write a play about the NEP. <laughs> it's a, I want to write a play against the NEP. And I said, nobody's going to watch it. <laughs> I said, what's, what's your story? So he ended up writing a story about an uh, Indian politician who fakes his own death. <laughs> but we find that the reason he fakes his own death is because maybe like your character, the system is something which he feels is against him, but he wants his son to think he's a hero. So he, he has done a lot of wrong. He has been, he's done a lot of wrongdoing in his life. But when he knows he's going to get found out, he, the most important thing was t still to be a hero in the, in the eyes of the people he thinks are important. And then it became a very, you know, I think a very uh, powerful story because it wasn't um, just about how terrible the system was, but you saw the love of the son for his father, the love of the father for his son, complicated relationship with the wife. So I think there's many different kinds of ways to counter darkness, right? Yeah. But some people say that the great art comes from depression. <laughs> and uh, some people say that great art comes from blessings. So, what's your take on it? Yeah. You've been asking me a lot of questions. I just need to get down to mine here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think there is a great link, of course, between creativity and depression. <laughs> I think there is, whether we like it or not. Um, but you, y y it's... Um, 
I think sadness, maybe also, <laughs> uh, feeling, looking at the situation, things around you, and feeling unable to do anything about it, and uh, trying to create something from this this blackness uh, helps you in some way. So I, I think that uh, I, I remember, I remember, maybe I'm, I'm uncomfortable at the moment talking about it, so I'll come back to it. But I remember Namron having a conversation with, the, with the, the actor and filmmaker Namron many years ago, and he said when he was young, he said, I found it so easy to be creative. Everything was terrible. The world was so demonic. I could, there were demons all around me, he said. So he created all, a lot of really wonderful work when he was young. Matt De, Matt De Rey, and he came out of his anger, came out of his frustration from as a young man growing up in Perlis. But very funny pieces, really very, very funny, but came out of this kind of um, anger and depression. And to the point, in fact, that when he was studying at ASK, um, they said he had to go for psych psychological counseling. And he really resisted this, but then the people kept, t kept telling him, no, there's something psychologically wrong with you, you're disturbed. And he said it was Christian Jit, the director, who told him, you're not, nothing wrong with you psychologically, you just need to do theatre. You need to create work because these are, it's, a, it's, it's your angin, right? There's a desire inside you to say something and no one's allowing you to say it. So that's what's, what, that's what's creating the greater um, depression maybe than, than, um, than the than actual depression. Um, so I think that it's hard to, I don't think we create anything when we're in that complete state of depression. I think it's very, it's impossible. But it's, it's that trying to keep it at bay. It's uh, when we make something, we can push against it to create something. Um, and then he said to me later, oh, now I'm married, I've got two children, I'm so happy, it's so hard. <laughs> but so he said, but you said, so you have to go looking for it. You have to go looking for the things which are, which do upset you. And there's lots of things in the world which, you know, we just open our eyes. I mean, um, if you think about it, it's, uh, there is um, everything you look at is worth exploring. You just need to uh, look closer. And there are stories all around us that we feel we want to tell. I think a lot of the time maybe we shut ourselves off from those things because it's too difficult to look at. Um, and I think, of course, once you look at things, it can affect you very powerfully, it can affect you very emotionally. And a lot of the time, maybe people go through their life not wanting to confront, not wanting to look at those things. And in fact, my grab car driver on the way, having a talk with him, you know, discovered, I discovered that really that's what he wanted to do with his life. But at every point of his life, people told him, don't do that, don't do that, never do that. And um, then he said, oh, I hit rock bottom. So I said, I'm trying to re rediscover myself by driving my grab car because now I'm just going to be by myself and find out who, who, who I am. And, I, you know, it's, it's that. That maybe he will, he said, not, I don't have a happy ending just yet, but I think maybe one day I will. Mm. And how about yourself then? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's obviously a question that you've been thinking about a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think I, probably anger mm, gives, given me some inspiration, but definitely depression is not productive for me. Mm. But uh, I used to wonder this, because the reason why I asked this question, because I used to wonder, and then I, I found someone else, and then he told me that a great artist, he will absorb the depression, all the bad things, and then he will give back only beautiful things in the form of art. So that is the, that is why some artists, they cut their ears, because they're absorbing it and then giving back by filtering all the bad things and then only giving good things. And then once I discover that, I, I find it very uh, uh, useful technique to filter and to give it back in, in a much more uh, beautiful way. So, so I, 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 I completely get out from that uh, dilemma once I got this technique, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, earlier you were talking about those, um, you know, that you, you don't think you're going to write the story, you've got to write the story, and then you find yourself writing a different story, right? So, um, I mean, apart, with, um, apart from Jagat, have you had other experiences where you're trying to do one thing and then you realize that's not what you really want to do and something else is, is um, calling you more strongly? Oh, yeah, of course. I used to write um, pa parody scripts, I used to write even, I even tried superhero scripts, you know, um, horror comedy. I, I, I tried, you know, because I was wondering, because I was looking for my voice. And then uh, as a, just a normal person who watch all these um, normal commercial 
uh, no Hollywood movies and also some. So I was just an ordinary boy, ordinary consumer, I would say, ordinary consumer was trying to imitate this kind of works. But then I, I found out that it is not my, my, uh, my cup of tea, actually. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful that I finally I, I made Jagat. Otherwise, I, I would have done something else that is not really in line with me. You were telling me yesterday about the time that you, you, you watched Red Sorghum yeah, yeah. and how that just changed you because yeah. finally you saw a film that meant something to you. Yeah. You want to just talk about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> because when I was a kid, I used to watch um, lots of uh, movies from, from South India, the Tamil movies and also Cantonese movies because they, they show it in RTM, uh, right? Cantonese movies uh, and uh, also Hollywood movies. These are the movies that I've grown up watching it. But then at one point I was watching uh, Zhang Yimau's Red Shorgam because uh, just like the Tamil movies, I mean, once a year RTM will screen you know, Telugu movies and Malayalam movies for Ugadi and for Onam. You know? And also for, I think, uh, for similar, uh, they will replace with Mandarin movies. And, uh, and usually Mandarin movies are boring compared to the Cantonese movies. You know, it's, it's, it's this commercial, right? But then when I, when I saw Red Shorgam, uh, I was much connected to that movie compared to the Tamil movies. Because it was so, it, the story was so simple that the main character was talking about the love affair of the gallant parents. That story, can be set up anywhere in Malaysia, even in the rubber estate or in, in Palmer estate. So I, I, I feel that I was much more connected to Red Shorgam than the Tamil movies, without knowing who was the director. And after I went to uh, USM, they screened uh, Race the Red Lantern. Again, I'm not knowing who was the director, but I could feel that's a strong connection emotionally within the, the, these two movies. And later on only I found out that it was done by the same directors. So, uh, Red Shorgam, I watched it when I was 10, probably. And Race the Red Lantern, I watched it when I was 21. So, it, it was so beautiful that art can transcend beyond the language, race, uh, age, mindset. So, the, uh, the, the feel was so beautiful that, yeah, it was... The other day I was talking with Abang Uwe. He also said that... Uh, he liked watching horror movies, but it doesn't affect his way of making movies. But then, when he watched European movies, he feel connected. Even though we all watching, uh, grow up, he, he grow on, growing up watching all the Hindustani movies in the 70s. But then when he watched the... Uh, because Malay, Malay movies in the 70s are much more influenced by the drama of the Bollywood, right? But he said he was much connected to the Europe, European uh, way of making movies. So. So for me, it's, 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 it's beautiful how art can transcend into, into, you know, into some other medium scene. Yeah, so beautiful, yeah. Um, you said when you were a younger artist, you were, you were looking for your voice, and so you were trying out all these different forms, I mean, horror, comedy, et cetera, et cetera. But do you feel that with Jagat, you found your voice, or that it's, you're, on a, you're try, still trying to find your voice? But what does that mean, this idea of you know, finding that voice? Yeah, yeah, I'm still finding my voice, actually. Uh, when, when people saw Jagat, they, they thought that uh, realism is my, my forte. Actually, probably it's not. Probably uh, I've chosen the realism because the story needs that format. That, 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 that content re demands the, the realism uh, story. So I didn't choose it, the, the story chose it itself. Um, I, I don't even watch uh, realism movies even before Jagat. I watched Satyajit Ray's movie only after I made Jagat. Because some people, uh, they said Jagat might be an inspiration from Satyajit Ray movies. So it's not. I watched uh, Satyajit Ray movie after Cat, where's Cat? <laughs> she, she passed me the DVD. Cat Khalid, yeah, she passed me the DVD. And then only I watched uh, Satyajit Ray movie. Uh, even the train scene. It is already inside us. It's organically. It's, it's uh, whatever happened in Jagat, good and bad things. It was not done by myself. It was done organically. When I choose my actors as uh, non-actors, I didn't know that in the in the, in the, the realism movie they choose 
non actors i wanted to do that because i have no choice <laughs> <laughs> so many things happen yeah. organically yeah. so yeah i'm still finding for my voice i i'm still looking for my voice actually who who am i i mean what is my forte i'm still looking for it yeah. so yeah I think Rahel said earlier that the creative process is so messy, right? It's not like we decide, let's do this one thing and then we pursue it and we arrive at the destination we were headed for. You know, we're trying to go to Klang and we end up in Golok instead. <laughs> so we, it actually is never a very clear, very straight path. Um, and I think for me that's kind of what's interesting about trying to create something. You just have to go in that direction that you feel you're, you're going in at the time. But if you, something tells you to make a left turn, you have to make a left turn. Yeah. 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 So... I mean, what are the, your experiences of, of that left turn? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm trying to be like water, actually. So I'm ready to, uh, I'm ready to ruin my reputation, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I have, <laughs> I'm ready to ruin everything, yeah. I'm ready to lose everything uh, in order to find something. If it can give something greater, I'm, I'm ready to do that. So that is why I don't want to put myself in in a category. I don't want to be attached mm. to certain things, or certain ideology, or certain people. You know, yeah. I don't want to be attached. Yeah. So I'm ready to I'm ready to be thrown away. Actually, yeah, yeah. I, I remember years ago when I I first was working in KL. I was quite a, when I was young in my twenties, and I met uh, Rafik Rashid, and he was already quite a successful musician, composer. Um, and he was already had a reputation for being a very funny guy. He would sing um, um, satirical songs in uh, various pubs in PJ. So he was, for me, you know, a very inspiring person. I spent a lot of time with him. But he told me once, he said, never become successful because people only want you to do, to do that one thing. Yeah, yeah. So people always wanted, he'd try to do other kinds of music and people would say, well, oh, sing your funny song about the fan. <laughs> and he's trying to do experimental music. He's trying to make music with the Orang Asli community that he was working with in KKB. And it was so hard for him to be destroyed. I, mean, I think he would have liked to say, no, I want to be destroyed. I'm going to start again, Phoenix from the ashes, make something new. And I think it, it is a, um, something I, I, I struggle with as well. I mean. As much as I really like the characters I play, it's sometimes I think that it's, it's such a burden. People want me to do those, those, those things. People want Instant Cafe to do the comedy reviews. And as soon as the elections were over, people were, well, Instant Cafe should do a comedy review. And I, and I felt, but do we need to? Surely that those comedy reviews were created because we needed them then. Do we need them now? And if we do, then what, what should they be? Should we, you know, when, do they have any kind of purpose? And I started wanting to do other kinds of things, and and um, and maybe I wasn't brave enough as you just to say, well, I'll just lose my reputation and go do something else. But so just been incrementally trying to do to do other kinds of work because I, I, those other kinds of work interest me. Um, and I think every time I have an opportunity, uh, then uh, I, I'll, t I'll try to take it. So, so I, I have this. I was doing a project with uh, again Namron and Kokman. And we decided we should make a piece of Malaysian theatre involving three of us. Uh, one from Chinese theatre, one from Malay theatre, one from English language theatre. And we're trying to say, please stop saying Malay theatre, English language theatre, <laughs> Chinese theatre. Um, but we decided we'll still do it you know, in, our own, in the languages that we're comfortable with. And we decided our th main theme was language. So we said, okay, let's create a piece of theatre that's... And our theme is language. I mean, this is after many... Um, many halal drinks <laughs> discussing this. Okay, a few non-halal as well. Um, and, um, and, we, and, we, and we kind of, because we're trying to figure out how to work together. It wasn't actually about what we we're trying to do, but to say, look, if we work together, it sends a, a kind of an, uh, it sends a vibration through the community to say, yeah, we, we have three different companies, but we want to work together to create this one thing. And you know, we, we, we were very inspired to say we will do this once every few years. We've done it twice now, so we haven't stuck to it, but those you know, best, best intentions. And um, so I was thinking, okay, my job here in part of this collaboration is try to create a piece of theater which is about language. And I just couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't. And I thought I'm being such a bad collaborator, I'm, 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 I'm being uh, such a, uh, a bad third person in this group of three. Um, and I would be sitting in my study, you know, with my open laptop and nothing is happening. Because actually there was nothing inside me. There was nothing outside me. There was no attendant spirit either who wanted me to write anything about language. 
But what kept coming to me was my mother, who had passed away the year before. So my mother kept coming into the room, and I kept on saying to her, this is not about you. <laughs> this, is, this is not about you. I, I, I'm supposed to be writing this other thing. And, and my mother, who was never a very demanding person, just kept coming into the room and saying, no, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Until finally I thought, okay, I need to just write something to get, get it out of my system, to write this thing that I needed, that my mother needed me to write. But it ended up, because she's much cleverer than me, <laughs> and all these creative things which are outside us are cleverer than us, um, in the act of doing that, I actually realized I was writing a piece about language, and I ended up writing a piece called Silence, Please, where all these the characters had lost their ability to speak any language because their mother had died. And so in the piece of that, we then, I said to the others, this is about language. It's about the inadequacy <laughs> of, of language in these sorts of instances. So I, I, I think those sorts of instances where you really resist something and then you say, okay, I cannot resist it anymore, and you go there, then, you, then something happens. You know, if you keep resisting it, then nothing can happen. And you can resist the boy for so long, but then at some point, the boy will say, no, you need to tell the story. And the, believe me, the story that the boy wants to tell is a story that you've always wanted to tell, which is the story of the system, <laughs> right? And in my story, too, because I, I, I thought I was going to write then a personal story about my mother, but it wasn't. It was also a story about body snatching in Malaysia. <laughs> it was a story about my imagining what would happen if on the day of the funeral, the authorities um, came and said, this mother does not belong to you, her body is ours, and take her away. Because I think I was feeling this is what was going on in the country, that we, we were not allowed to um, even have our most private moments of grief, that uh, power and authority would come in, and even at your most vulnerable, when you're confronting death, they will snatch it, snatch away your, your soul. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I had wanted to ask you a question about suffering, but I think you kind of dealt with that with the idea of, of um, depression. Um, I want to talk to you, ask you about the idea of you know creating in fragments. Like sometimes, do you just have an image? Does an image come? I mean, you talked about it a bit when you talked about you always saw that valley with that roof and all the rest of it. What other kinds of fragments and or images do you have in your mind that you think you know what? I don't know why it's there, but it's there for a reason. Yeah. I think for me, sometimes, sometimes, I know, sometimes, most of the times. Um, I think feelings is the is the best way to more than the visual. I think uh, I get attacked by the feelings. Yeah, yeah. So I think image is the secondary thing. So probably the first thing that entered to our self is feelings. Uh, probably the feelings create the image, and then from the image we create words. It's like here and there, and then when we put it in the paper, we just mix it all together and it com comes out as something else. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's the most, um, I think it's the feelings, feelings, yeah. Sometimes it's scary to, that is why sometimes I have to be careful with what kind of feelings or what kind of thoughts that we are cultivating. So, so if it's for me, basically. I, at one point I, I started to filter what kind of thoughts that I'm having right now because I'm, uh, I'm afraid that these feelings it's going to create thoughts, image, words, and then it will come out as artwork. <laughs> so, what, so why are you trying to filter those? Uh, Don't you want those? No, I'm not, I'm not trying to filter, but I'm just trying to understand why at this particular time these kind of thoughts appear. Does it because of my, my senses? Does it because of my desire? Or does it, it comes purely without, without influence of the desire? So I think there is two kind of feelings. One comes through the desire, mm -hmm. the other one comes in purely. Mm -hmm. So the one comes through the desire door. I think it's it's created by myself. Mm -hmm. The one comes purely. It's it doesn't create it by myself. Mm -hmm. It is from the source. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to identify which one is coming through myself and which one is coming. Mm, yes. Yeah, in an organic way. Yeah. I mean, sometimes things happen because somebody prompts you. 
and it may be not even be a prompt that somebody wants, uh, that you want. So I remember some years ago, again, this is just after the last general, not the last general election, the, the terrible general election in <laughs> before this one, and, um, and a friend of mine, J Jason Tan, who was working at the time at BFM um, on a new digital platform called The B-Side, uh, and I think it was before the elections, he wrote and he said to me, Why don't you, can you write something for the B-Side, write a short story for the B-Side about how you feel about the elections coming up? And I said, oh, maybe it was after, I've got a shocking memory. And I said, oh, I don't have time. I said, I'm, I'm about to leave to go to Singapore for something and I, I don't have time and I, I don't want to keep writing these political things and political analyses. I'm so tired of it. I want to write human stories. <laughs> so I said, no, Jason, I really have to say no to you. But I always feel very guilty. I, I'm almost Catholic in this way. Um, even though I'm not Catholic, I suffer from Catholic guilt. So I felt terrible to say no to Jason for anything. So I, I, so I kept apologizing to him. He said, he said well, no, I'm, you know, if you want to think about it, have a think about it. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll think about it. And it so happened that my cab to the airport broke down. And I was just going there for a reading of a script, so I didn't have anything on me. I didn't have, a, I didn't have anything on me. I didn't even have a book. And my flight was from KLIA 2. There's nothing in KLIA 2 to do. All I had was my Blackberry, which, you know, in those days, Blackberry. So I was sitting there at KLIA 2 thinking, well, I've got, I had to wait for the next flight. So I was waiting, kind of kill time. So I thought, oh, I've got my Blackberry. I may as well start writing something. And, but I, I, and I only had this one image of, in my head. I had an image of Najib losing the elections. And, and that filled me with great happiness. <laughs> you know, and I, kept, I just kept imagining what it would be like if he woke up one morning and he'd lost the elections. So I just imagined him lying in bed in his bright red pajamas. For me, it's always very visual. Bright red pajamas. And he was had this huge four-poster bed and silk sheets. And, um, and the whole bed was covered in food, right? Which he had, hadn't really eaten and that he'd been, that he'd been kind of been left over food for days and days because he hadn't wanted to get out of bed. So that was my image. Najib doesn't want to get out of bed because he's lost the elections. And outside he can hear all the things happening. He can hear trucks rumbling. He can hear, he can hear the lack of servants. He can hear the fact that his wife is not there. And he's just very, very upset. And he's, you know, and this, and this, and then in my imagination, he was eating ravioli with tomato sauce. And then the ravioli spilled on the bed, and then there's blood. So then I began to feel about the blood, you know, that's out there, <laughs> that's on his hands. <laughs> and so I ended up writing a story about a, I didn't say Najib, I said, I said about a man who wakes up, you know, um, and I wrote about it in the first person, you know, uh, no, not in, the, in the third person, who would have thought this would ever happen? You know, he sat and picked at the food and didn't, was, wasn't happy. And, but I wrote this because I just wanted to believe this could happen. <laughs> um, but in the story, so the story kind of uh, talks about this kingdom where this person has um, recently lost his kingdom. They've taken away his jaguar. They've only left the hippos at the bottom of the garden. And of course, all these things were metaphorically there, connected to very Malaysian things. But, uh, but you know, the spires and the minarets and the bridges and the water and the lakes were supposed to be evocative of Putrajaya. But I didn't want to write it directly. But in the in the short story, at the end of it, he doesn't give up. He, he looks at a picture of himself all dressed in military gear, and he, he's like a crocodile, he's, right? he's like a survivor crocodile. And in fact, all the, in the story, his childhood is all spent in crocodile country. So at the end, he's like this amphibian creature who will always survive, like a cockroach will survive. <laughs> so in my short story, he survives. Um, because I think I end, end up finishing the story once the elections were lost, and I was so upset, because I thought, oh, he will always survive. Um, and then later I turned this, I, and, I, I, and that's the story I wrote, and then later I turned it into a play where I added a lot more elements which were from an other obsessions, early obsessions with the kind of Malay supernatural world, where then, in fact, he has murdered somebody and is now going to use the blood of that murdered person to rule the kingdom. Um, I didn't sit, set out to write this. I, I never thought by myself, oh, I want to write something about Najib. I want, I want to write, I, in fact, I always thought I don't want to write anything about the elections. I don't want to write anything about the country anymore. And then somebody prompted it. And that thing that was always there, that concern, that upset, that anger, <laughs> then turns itself into something. Um, but doesn't turn it, it, it didn't turn into that to begin with. It, it started off as a fragment. And then I was like, oh, what's this? And then, my, and then I had to get on my plane. And then I left it, and then I came back to it. So for me, that's 
often how things are. It's not like, um, I mean, I'm sure you have things where you've written something, you put it away. Mm. Like, how, how many things have you got put away <laughs> in your drawer? <laughs> Um, hello, I'm Li Wang Choi, and I'm just helping with the uh, questions and answers. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll come to you with the microphone. Yeah. That's okay. The, um, hello. Hi. Uh, Thank you, fascinating. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you're both directors, and, uh, but you know, one on stage, one in film. And I, I'd, I'd really like to know about uh, what do you imagine you are as directors? What kind of directors are you when you're on set or, or in the rehearsal room? What are you trying to achieve? And especially we, when we began talking about performances, how do you both go about grabbing performances especially from non-professional actors, a child, how do you, and it was a great performance, how do you, how do you achieve these performances? I mean, do you make them cry? <laughs> <laughs> Cam always thinks I make people cry. <laughs> it's not true, right? <laughs> um, so the question is, is, is about how, how do we work with actors? Is, mm. Yeah, I think I see myself as an actor's director, meaning that for me it's... Um, if, because this, they're the vehicle, right? If the actor... You need the actor to be able to truthfully tell this large story. Within that body, you need to see uh, not just the story that's in the script, you need to see the story that's not in the script. You need them to convey... Um, uh, so many really large things, and that's why for me, I'm really obsessed with casting the right person. I mean, when, when I did Aircon some years ago, I think we auditioned 50 boys for two roles. Uh, and I mean, I remember me and Zalfian, you know, like sitting in the car, because Zalfian was my co-director, trying to find boys, right? And he's on the phone, I said, you sound like a pimp. You know? He said, I'm looking for a 14-year-old boy, quite, quite nice looking, quite slim, must be attractive in this way. I also need a boy that doesn't have to be so good looking, but tall, you know? And you're, but you also know you're looking for a certain kind of, not just how they look, but then when you meet them, you know you're looking for that, that thing which you can't explain to somebody. When you see them, you think, oh, that's right, that's what I need. I need that, that quality that that person have. And in, when I did um, Aircon, I had two actors who were from um, ASK, Ashwara, and they were very good actors, but they had never done anything as challenging as this, and I think they, they really uh, were quite fabulous. But there's also one particular character, a character called Mona, right? And Mona's character was somebody, I mean, she was always called Mona and her best friend was called Mimi. They're both boys. And I can't remember their real names now, but in, in the school, in the life of this play, they were always called Mona and Mimi because they were obviously very Mona and Mimi. Um, so how to find somebody like this, but um, who, who um, isn't um, a stereotype in, in some way. And actually, it was a mechanical engineering student who came to audition, who had never done any theater before, but he was very small, quite stocky, had a certain brightness in his face and an, an intelligence, but was just a little bit off-center, just a little bit, tiny bit off-center, something about him. And, and um, so I, I cast him because he, he, was, he wasn't experienced as an actor at all, but I just felt that he could give me something that an experienced actor could not give me, and that I would find a way to, to allow him to, uh, to uh, show what that, that quality was that I think I recognized in him. But of course, sometimes in rehearsals, it's a struggle. And I was like, oh, why did I choose this person? <laughs> and one day, I said to him, because he was supposed to be conveying something uh, in this scene, and he, he couldn't really find it, and I said to him, who's the person you'd really like to see more than anybody else in your life? Like, how would you, you'd feel so excited if you saw them? And he said, um, Adiba Noor. Adiba Noor, right, the, the actress and singer. He said, Adiba Noor. So I said to, her, to him, I just said, you know, what if she was sitting right there in the audience? And he went, oh! I mean, I, I just, I just imagine, and just, just from imagining, he immediately imagined her. So every night he would imagine her sitting in the audience, and that's how he got his performance on, right? Because he, and, it, it gave him a kind of lift in his 
whole presence that maybe out of the corner of his eye, he might spot her. And then lo and behold, oh gosh, she does come and watch the show. And um, yeah, he's completely smitten. Uh, but you know, it's, so I think sometimes it's, um, especially when you're working with non-actors, you've got to find a way for them to come out and show you what's inside them that is, that we need for, from them as performers. Yeah. And actually, I really like working with non-actors sometimes for this reason, because they surprise you. Uh, uh, as for me, um, uh, I'm not a professional, you know, acting coach. Or I just follow my. Uh, I let it be to be organic. So, in particular case in Jagar, because Jagar was my first ever uh, fiction narrative movie. Uh, previously, I was doing more documentary and travelogue, and also I've done a few short films. But Jagar was my first experience to. Uh, to work with the actors. So I think I'm not sure what kind of person I was in the set. Uh, but uh, one thing I'm sure that I'm totally a different person in the set. Uh, I think in Jagat, I, I have to work with three layers. Uh, I, I describe myself as a fan and as a dictator and also as a uh, as a hunter. Um, with Apoi, I was hunter because I have to hunt for a perfect moment from him. So he, sometimes he will take 40 to 50 takes. So I'll be waiting for that moment like a hunter. Once I get that particular moment, I will stop and then say, I got, I got the moment. So with Apoi, I was like a hunter. And with some other actors, I have to be a dictator because they couldn't perform. So I just say, you just give this, that's it. So they will give that. And certain actors are at least experienced a bit. They're good actors, actually. So with them, I, I became a fan. I said, you just give whatever you give. I'm going to enjoy. So, so I, ha I had to, I hate to be a dictator, but I, I have to. Uh, so because, because I have to work with a different a kind of actors, uh, because the problem is we we do have a very good uh, Indian actors in Malaysia, but the problem is almost 95 percent they are following the pattern of the Indian cinema. That's the problem. So at some point you have to break them, you have to bring them down, you have to make make sure that they unlearn first, and then you 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 know you give them a new exposure. So that's the thing, I mean, it's a terrible experience and also a beautiful experience for me, working with uh, non-actors. I, I do enjoy working with non-actors, actually, even though it's really uh, tiring, yeah. But I do enjoy working with non-actors. <laughs> uh, Joe and Sanjay, we have a question from here. This is for both of you. Uh, who or what taught you to speak truth to power? <laughs> I think for me it's quite simple. So it's my parents. I think uh, I, I I don't think that we thought about it in that way. But my mother would always say, you know, always look out for the underdog. <laughs> um, and um, I think my my, my father uh, maybe just could because of I mean he was a he was a journalist, so that was what he did. So it, 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 it didn't see, wasn't an unnatural thing. I, I, kind of, I think we were thought that everybody kind of spoke truth to power. Um, you, you grew up on stories of the emperor's new clothes and things like this. I think you think that's what you're supposed to do. Um, I, my dad was very fond, Susie will know this, of saying children should be, can be obscene but not ob absurd. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and, or he'd say, uh, um, yeah, you, I mean, I think he, he, he felt that as children, you should also speak the truth to your parents and to people around you. Uh, if you have an opinion, voice it. Yeah. I think, as for me, I think it's, it's just the being in a charm, 
and being a rebel, when, uh, when you just oppose things, there's a charm in it, you know. So <laughs> in the beginning, the charm is like, it's, it's, it's much attractive. It's like being rebellious is giving like you some kind of power and attention. You know? And later on, I found out that um, I found the balance in between uh, being rebellious and being inside the system. I think that should be a balance. So, so I'm not sure. I mean, probably in the beginning, uh, when I was in the, in, the, in, the, in the TV industry, everyone else was bribing and in the corruption. So I have to do something which is totally to, you know, inclined towards the truth. So that's the only option that I, I had. So, yeah, I mean, probably, um, I don't know, I mean, I still, I'm still wondering you know, about the truth, yeah. yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's, you know, we don't really think that we are who we are. I mean, I'm sure you don't think, maybe when you were younger, when you wanted to be a gangster, you thought you were a rebel. I never thought of myself as being a rebel. I always thought I'm a nice, polite girl. <laughs> it's, that's how I always saw myself. And then my report card always said, Joe's a very polite, shy girl. Um, but I remember when I, um, after my A-levels, my, my A-level li literature teachers, they were a couple, and when I went to visit them in the UK, they gave me a present of a, of a book of poetry. And mm -hmm. the book of poetry was the book of unrespectable verse. And I remember thinking, is that how they saw me? You know, because I didn't see myself as that. And later when I sort of doing, did, started doing satire, people said, well, of course. I mean, my school friends were, oh, yeah, of course, th that would be what you would do. And I was like, really? No, I, I'm such a nice person. <laughs> I'm so polite. I'm, so we don't, I don't know. I never see myself as that. But yet, I do have an, I do have an anti... I don't like authority. I think I've never really liked authority from the time that I was small, for whatever reason. Uh, question over here. Yeah. Hi. Firstly, I'm truly big fans of both your work. And um, I think it's great that it's like what you were describing is like photosynthesis. You're taking carbon dioxide and producing oxygen for us, breathing new life through art, so thank you. My question is somewhat related to your last comment, Joe, and um, the two questions. First, do you see the art you produce as a way to, deal, to get closure over the emotions you have, be it anger or upset or sadness or joy? Is it a way to, for closure of that chapter? And secondly, through manifestation of your characters and your work, be it on screen or through theatre, how does that then impact you as a person on a personal level? Do you, do you grow or do you see a different perspective through your own work? Thank you. <laughs> Can you say the first question again? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, first question was, is art through the expression, I mean, is an art a platform through which you express yourself and that expression grants you closure over certain emotions, be it anger, sadness? Is it a closure or do you continue to carry emotional baggage through those expressions or is art for you to, a way for you to release how you feel? Like how people box or run to release adrenaline and anger, is art something of that sort? Thank you. I don't think I would think of it as in that way. I don't think I set out thinking I will do this in order to get closure or to deal with something. It's, um, and, and sometimes, a lot of the time, in fact, I, I create things which I just create just to put away. You know, you know we, maybe that the, the using of your hand in, to write things is a way to sort of deal with things for sure. I, I think especially for me writing, actually more than performing. And a, a lot of the performance came out of trying to write something uh, for a character or feeding a character then having to write their lines down for them because they're too lazy to do it themselves. Um, but I, I don't think I, I don't think it was ever to seek closure. But maybe sometimes that happens, you know, whether you like it or not. And sometimes we do create, I mean, I do write things after a very difficult experience um, as a way to um, try to make sense of it, actually. Maybe it's that. It's, you don't write it to have closure. You, you write it to make sense of something. And then when you do that, what I'm more interested in is I then begin to find a larger pattern and that is not just connected to me. And I think that's why I, I really connect with what you said about Apoi, that you thought you're trying to write a story about this boy, but actually your concerns all your life was about the system. And I think that my concerns all my life have always been about the system <laughs> as well. I, I'm, I'm concerned about this larger uh, you, you, 
um, country that we live in, but also sometimes the larger universe that we live in. What's this larger, you know, spiritual framework that we that we exist inside? What are those larger mysteries? Um, so um, I think it's not to find closure, but maybe it happens accidentally. And then your second question was, um, it's very complicated, your question. Sorry. Yeah, anyway, my first question was actually whether you do get closure from it, oh, so yeah. thank you. Um, second question was, from the output of your artwork, does it, what sort of an impact does it have on you personally? Do you, do you learn from yourselves and what do you learn from the art that you produce? Thanks. Yeah, um, personally, I mean, um, when I, uh, after I did Jagat, I think I'm, I'm completely, a totally a different person because, uh, yeah, I made peace with myself, actually. Yeah, I, I already started to see beyond 12, 12 years boys uh, view probably and uh, also I uh, I done a documentary called uh, the river rain uh, the day the river and raid it's about my grand grandfather and also it's about a tragedy happened in my hometown um, so it was a documentary about uh, tracing back my, my my grandfather so when I was doing that documentary uh, I I kind of I felt that my grandfather is talking to me through the feelings, and then I figure out that uh, he it's it's, it's kind of he's trying to tell me that whatever things, good things and bad things that happen in his life is kind of he's telling his regrets. Uh, I found out that I'm exact copy of my grandfather from the behavior because I was talking to my my grandfather's friend, so he was describing my grandfather and my crew was laughing looking at me. <laughs> so, uh, when he was telling about my, my grandfather, uh, I decided that I don't want to, I want to grab a good things that he have done and then I, I wanted to get rid of whatever bad things that he, he, he have done or he had in his life. So after I made the documentary, I, I, I totally became a completely uh, different person actually. So yes, of course, the, the artwork truly liberates us. It is in my own, uh, in own experience, yes. Uh, one more question here. Um, hi. So as a storyteller and a creator, I think, of uh, theatre and, and uh, even movies, do you have an audience in mind when you sort of create or write stories for? I mean, also considering Malaysia is such a diverse um, country. Um, so when you do create or write, you know, do, you, do you have someone in mind that you want to speak to, that you want to communicate with? I would say generally no. I, I, I don't think about the audience first. Um, whatever that, that creative impulse is. I, I mean, I, I, won't talk for, I won't talk about the Instant Cafe comedy reviews or the, those characters because maybe they were kind of, they were created in a way for the public, <laughs> in, in, in some sense for the public, um, but also in a sense, some sense for our own personal catharsis. Um, but, I mean, for example, um, over, over the last 10 years, I've been writing um, poems, right? Which I don't show any, hardly, I, I, I show hardly anyone. Um, and some of them are very personal, which is why I don't show them to people. And then last year, um, I was asked by this group um, um, called uh, If Walls Could Talk, if I would share some of my poems. And I said, oh, but I do write poetry. And they said, oh, we hear what you do. <laughs> and, and in fact, th these are, these, this is a thing where you know I say I want to break myself because actually this is the kind of writing I really like to like to do, but I, I feel I feel nervous to share with other people. So I think I have no right. Who wants to hear this stuff? Okay, I can do your comedy stuff because you all want that because you need it. I can fool myself to thinking it's a public good, but actually the, the, those personal things we don't feel are for any public good. So or, or I don't feel and and I and I'm shy or nervous to share them in public, but. I felt bad to keep saying no, that's that Catholic guilt again. <laughs> so after maybe like six months of people, very really kind people asking me if I would, then I felt, oh, why am I being, I don't want to be that person who just says no to people and they've got a really good initiative and I really like what they're doing. So I said, sure. And then I fretted about it for a very long time after. But I ended up performing these very personal po poems about my mother. 
And uh, I mean, you were there. And I was shocked because I realized, no, I wasn't shocked, but I realized, yeah, these things that you write not for an audience mean something for an audience. You don't write them for them, but you write them because there's some um, need to write it. And, and obviously you write it always for it to be heard. And then once it gets heard, um, then I felt that sen great sense of liberation that finally some things which I'd written 10 years ago were being heard by, by people and finally they, become, they became art. They weren't art before that when they were sitting in my drawer. <laughs> but then they became truly, I think, a piece of, yeah, a piece of creative work. As for me, I, I do work in two different levels. Certain of my works, I don't really care about my, my, my audience. And some of the, my works, I do care about my, my audience. Uh, like, as for Jagat, I, I had to do some compromise so that it, re it reaches the Malaysian audience first. Because I think it's, it's easier to impress the international film festivals. But then to communicate, to resonate with the local audience is very hard. So that is why in Jagat, I, I already decided that I wanted to communicate with, in the two levels as well. I wanted to communicate with the Indian community. I want to share with them the actual history that I want, I want to share with the Indian audience. And with the non-Indian audience, the Malaysian audience, I want to tell the Indian story, the Malaysian Indian story, saying that we are all living together, but we are the cause of the problem. Each, we, 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 we are the cause of problem for, because we, we live together, Our, we, we interrelate. So that, that's why I wanted to express in Jagat. So yes, in Jagat, I do have think about my audience. And I also have done some of the works that I don't really care about the audience. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, so I happen to be writing a play and a film at the same time, so this question goes for both of you. Uh, so what do you do when you are stuck? And I mean, most writers, directors, well, you go through this where you, like you, the characters are kind of there and then the plot, the, the, the plot, the themes, the setting is kind of there, but you're like, some you want them to be this way, but you're also prepared to let it go. So you're standing in this thing where everything's shifting and you're not quite sure what's the right way. Or another analogy is you're standing in the forest and it's all foggy you don't know how to move forward. And so you're in this space where you're, half, you're somewhere between procrastination and writer's block, right? When you're in that state, what do you do? Uh, normally, I, I write a uh, few stories together. So when I stuck with this story, I'll jump to another story. <laughs> so at one point, I'll get a solution for this, so I just keep on jumping. I find it easier because I can forget about this. Yeah? But, uh, but once, we f once we ignore, it will start to seek the attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, that, that I'm quite similar. That's why I have a lot of fragments, and then suddenly I'm like, oh, this one, I'm going to finish this one, and then I can finish it after like, not being able to finish it for years. Um, because, as you said, something is, it calls you. Um, but sometimes if you, let's say you have a deadline <laughs> and you only have one thing and you have to, you have to do it, uh, you have to trick yourself um, or trick the universe uh, around you. Um, <laughs> I want to say to you sock puppets, actually, because a friend of mine who's a, play, who's a playwright, uh, he told me that he used to use sock puppets to, you know, uh, because it just made him feel silly. So you, br you break out of that, oh no, I'm trying to write this very serious film, I'm trying to write this very serious play. So then he would just like, crip, you know, put, put buttons on socks and make them talk to each other. And um, some years ago I was working on a play, again with Cam Razlan, who's in my life far too much. And, um, and I was writing a play with Cam Razlan and um, there was this, a group of ghosts and I knew something would have to happen with this group of ghosts in this story at this point, you know, reaching, reaching towards a climactic point. But I didn't know how to write that scene where things would be discovered. I just was really, really stuck. And so, you know, then that idea of location, location, location. <laughs> so one of them uh, was an English ghost, an Englishman from the 19th century, George, remember George? So I thought, well, what if George just organizes a cricket match? <laughs> So, for, and there was no reason, there was no purpose for it in the plot at all, but just um, had, the, had all of them playing cricket to break, the, to break, where your, to, to break your, your clever brain and, and dislocate it. 
And an another friend of mine who's also a writer tells me what she does, she opens a book and just takes a sentence and dislocates her brain there and sees where that sentence takes her. And you may think, oh, that's a terrible idea. It's not going to work. But what else have you got to lose? <laughs> At that point, nothing. I think dislocating the brain. I think because, you know, we get stuck. And it, get, trying to go further is like, you know, mud in wheels in mud. You're not going to get any further. Okay, well, we could stay and listen to both of you <laughs> for the rest of the evening, but I think we've kind of come to the end of the program because <laughs> I know you've got places to go and things to do. Uh, but on behalf of Ilham, I uh, just want to thank both of you so much, uh, Joe Kukadas and Sanjay Kumar Paramo for such an interesting and inspiring <laughs> afternoon.